Hi there. Welcome to our webinar today. Today we have a great follow up to our webcast from last month on alternative assessments. And today is looking at some of the technology to support authentic assessments. Technology enabled alternative assessment, what it looks like and how to bring it to your institution. I'm Megan Raymond and I direct programs and membership here at WCET. And if this is your first event with us, I look forward to telling you a little bit more about our organization towards the end, but reach out if you have any questions at any time. Specific to this webinar, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll be sure to get to those as we can. We encourage you not to add your questions to the chat because sometimes there's a pretty robust conversation and the questions get lost. The slides are available. Kim will share the link and you can also access those on our website. We'll send you a link to the recording as well as the slides and any additional resources shared as a follow-up. And if you'd like to follow, follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET webcast. I'd like to acknowledge our partners today, Advanced Learning Technologies and, whoops, didn't mean to click the URL there. Go back to the share. And Vitac, who provides our sponsor or our captions here. So captions are available and you can access those. Again, if you have any questions, enter those into the QA and we'll be sure to get to those. I'm also the moderator today, so I get to wear two hats. I get to try and coordinate everything in the background and facilitate the conversation. So I'll be watching for your questions as well as your chats. Our speakers today are Steve Jordans and Dwayne Paré, and I'd like to go ahead and pass it off to them so that they can do introductions. Welcome. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much, Megan. I'm not sure if this is full screened right now when you- Yes, when I will fix that. Yeah. You'll play, you'll play with that. All right. Thank you, everybody, uh, for spending the time today and coming and seeing. I think you'll find it time well spent. Um, I, I'm looking forward to showing you uh, something that I think is, is really cool. Um, in fact, the, the sort of funnest thing I've done in my career, I think. And uh, along with me is also Dwayne Paré, um, who's labeled Steve Jordans as well. That's kind of interesting. There's two of me. <laughs> he doesn't know why. <laughs> um, but Dwayne uh, was my PhD student, and he is now uh, the CEO of a company called Cognito. Uh, that'll all make sense as we kind of go through this a little bit, I think. But Duane will also be watching the chat. Um, and, you know, Megan's right. If you have formal questions for me, the Q&A is great. But if you have quick little one-off questions, feel free to just throw them out and Duane will probably uh, answer on the fly. But there is a risk that you might not get at the end, uh, <laughs> as Megan suggested. All righty. Cool. So, um, hmm. I think I'm almost back to where we need to be. Excellent. There we go. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, let me just mention uh, quick that um, I'm the director. I'm, I'm a professor of psychology at University of Toronto, but I'm also director of what we call the Advanced Learning Technologies Lab. So ALT seems to fit this alternative assessment uh, theme pretty well. Um, we do do a lot of work on assessing educational technology. So just to give you a sense, you know, there's sort of three things we do. One is assess technology, and sometimes those are third party technologies. Um, and we assess them usually for efficacy and for usability primarily, um, but we also create educational technologies of our own. And in fact, one of the ones we're going to show you today um, is our pride and joy really that came out of the lab. Uh, and that is now a product that's out there and that Duane is the CEO for the company behind that. Um, so I'm not going to focus on the product today. I'm going to focus more on the actual learning process that it manages, uh, but we'll be seeing a little bit of that today. And of course, also we provide uh, research training for graduate students and others who are interested in this sort of research. Thank you. All right. So let's jump on. And just to you know, let you know that we do do a, a lot of research, um, continually publishing um, and trying to add to the evidence base. And, and specifically, our focus is often on trying to find educational practices that work well, say, even in a K-12 setting when done in a very paper and pencil way, but then asking, hey, if we embodied this into a technology, could we potentially make it more powerful pedagogically and could we allow its use to scale um, more so that it's very easy to, to bring into lots of context? That's really where our focus often is. Um, and yeah, let's just go to the next slide quick. 
Um, and this is three publications, three reports that are going to be related to what I'm going to talk about today. And Duane is going to paste in links to these three reports. So if you like what you hear and you would like to see some of the research and data behind it, uh, feel free to, to check out these reports. They're freely available online. Um, all right, so let's get into the actual story then. Cool. Yeah, um, COVID has has brought a lot um, to a lot of change to the educational world and educational institutions, and you know some of that change is just us dealing with COVID um, and and doing our best with the constraints that it provides. But we're also kind of doing innovative things and coming into contact with some new approaches. And you know my hope is that we don't lose some of that innovative um, stuff that we've come across. And, and in my opinion, the most mojo uh, is in these alternative assessments. And it's not just my opinion, of course, it's becoming a very popular topic, um, literally the globe over, as a lot of uh, institutions are starting to rethink the way they assess and, and in my opinion, really discover the pedagogical power that lies in assessments. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit generally today, but then I want to really show you. That's, that's the real goal here is to be concrete. So a little bit of chat at the beginning, and then we're going to get right into uh, a student experience and, and what it would be like talking about the pedagogy along the way. All right, so next slide here. This is the, the goal of my story, you know, boy meets girl stories. This is not a boy meets girl. It's, it's hopefully a pedagogical power meets easiness. And, and by easiness, I mean easy for the student to negotiate, easy for the faculty member to employ in their course, in their context, and easy for an institution to roll out and have used widely in their institution. Um, that's what technology can do when it's, when it's created well. It can handle all the logistics that allow us to get the power in a way that's just harnessed and very easy to use. So that's what I hope you leave here with is, is realizing, wow, this approach you described has a lot of pedagogical mojo, and wow, it's pretty easy to see how somebody would start using this tomorrow if they wanted to. All right, so that's my overarching story. Let's once upon a time it. So once upon a time, and, and we're still a little bit in this time, but universities really put most of their focus on information learning. And I don't wanna to be too strong here. We certainly tried to provoke critical thought and creative thought and that kind of stuff. But we would sometimes do that in sort of an informal way. The, the formal things we did were around teaching content. So lecturing, you know, giving students readings and textbooks, and then ultimately measuring what stuck um, by the end of it. Uh, and so that was really a, a focus on content. And, you know, I think we were quite comfortable doing that for many years because we know how to do it and we know how to measure whether we're doing it well. Um, and, and those are two important things, especially when you're an institution selling credentials, right? You wanna be able to measure the learning. Where I want to take the story here is to say, yeah, but the world has changed. Information is still important, but skills are way more important, maybe. And how can we now do for skills what we kind of did for information learning? That is, can we find a good way to develop skills? And can we measure that as we do it? And if we can, then I think we can bring a lot more skill learning into our programs. And that's what I'm going to be kind of uh, arguing for today. So let's continue the story then. Next slide. You know, why skills? Um, you've probably heard this so many times told in so many different ways, but the basic story is the job market, the job landscape is, is really evolving in a dramatic way. Um, so many jobs that we knew are just disappearing thanks to automation. Um, so a lot of common jobs are disappearing. There's new jobs emerging. And if you look at these top 10 emerging jobs, you see that they're not like, it's not like TV repairman. Uh, these are sort of general big data specialist. What's a big data specialist? Well, you can imagine that being a lot of different things. And, you know, a lot of these jobs are, are the kind that a person can't just learn a, a small set of, of knowledge and skills and do it well. The person needs to be more of a general scholar uh, of a sort. And, and so they need skills like collaboration. And this includes communication skills, right? Being able to listen to others, being able to express ourselves well, being able to work with others, uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, curiosity is kind of an interesting one to throw in there, um, and compassion. So these sorts of skills 
can help a student succeed in any career, uh, which is the other thing, by the way, people bring in is that sometimes uh, the recent data says students sometimes do five or six different jobs before they settle into a career. If they're going to be doing that, you know, moving from job to job, and, and if the jobs themselves are constantly changing, how do we equip them? Well, we equip them with the skills they can use to succeed in any context. And, and that's what these skills are. So none of this is meant to downplay the knowledge that we teach, that's still important. But the question is, can we augment that knowledge teaching and, and more formally bring in some skills practice and skills teaching as we do? Uh, and so I'm going to claim, yes, we can do that now. Uh, and so let's move on from here. Yeah. So a couple of things I just want to talk about at the front to, to position what we're talking about. In that traditional mindset, we would often see assessments in this bottom case, an assessment of learning. We would sometimes see it as a measurement of learning that happened previously. Uh, and so we're using this to see, you know, did it stick? Did, did the students um, acquire that knowledge? And we often compare that with our learning goals and various standards. Uh, and so it's a sort of a measuring stick of learning. Um, that approach to assessment, we call assessment of learning. But there's two other approaches that people are now realizing are very strong. Uh, assessment for learning. And the idea here is, yes, you're assessing the student, but you're trying to give them feedback about their learning and how they can improve. So it's not just where are you, you know, how good are you doing right now, but it's really like, how can I help you get better? Uh, and so we're using the assessment to help guide learning. And then the second one here in the middle, assessment as learning, this means this is a situation where the assessment process is in fact where the learning is happening um, that students as they're going through an assessment are being asked to monitor their progress and ask questions and practice skills um, i want to highlight that practice skills and i wouldn't use the word practice so much i would use the word exercise the skills to develop them because that's how skills develop um, and so it says here students use self assessment and teacher feedback to reflect on their learning consolidate their understanding and work towards learning goals, I would add to the self assessment and teacher feedback, um, I guess if you just hit the button once Megan maybe. Uh, peer assessment there it is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Back a couple now. Uh, there you go. Um, and so we're going to talk a lot about peer assessments, which which is not mentioned here, but will be the real driving force of, of the approach that i'm going to show you. Okay, so we keep that in mind. And then two other principles I just want to keep in mind to set the stage. Go ahead, Megan. Thank you. What, what, you know, what's, relate, what, what's so important about this approach, this sort of assessment as learning approach? Um, well, I like to say it this way. Engagement is the front door of learning. We know that, that our students are only going to learn when their mind is really there. And they are never more engaged than when they're being assessed. So we have their full attention in an assessment context, and therefore it's a great context for um, engaging and learning. Uh, so that's one principle to keep in mind. The other one I've alluded to already, but it's an important point. You can learn a lot about karate in an hour lecture, but if you want to learn to do karate, you're not going to learn it by just listening to somebody for an hour. You're going to have to do karate. Badly at first, probably, but if you have enough repeated structured practice, preferably in a feedback rich environment, your skills will slowly get better and better and better, and they could become second nature. You know, it could become somebody grabs you by the neck and you karate chop them before you before they even know what happened, maybe even before you know what happened. It's just became a reflex, right? This is what we would love to do for critical thought or creative thought or communication skills. We would like to make them second nature for our students so that they just think critically naturally um, or think creatively naturally. But if we want that to happen, we have to give them a very structured practice. You know, think about how you learn karate. You don't just sort of learn it from a book. You learn it by doing it in a very structured environment, uh, in a very formal way. And so you're going to see hints of that in the approach that we uh, discuss. Okay. And then I think two more slides and then we're on to the actual demo. <laughs> so this one is just to set up the demo. Everything's been vague. The whole idea here today is to be concrete. So we're about to get concrete. The first thing I want to do is just give you a sense of how the approach I'm going to describe compares to the traditional approach. And, and in the traditional approach, 
we would have students create something, some composition, according to, you know, this could be anything from a book report on Romeo and Juliet to a lab report to whatever, um, but they compose it and then they give it to us. We eventually grade it and give it back. In the formative peer assessment approach, I'm going to highlight, it starts the same. We give them some composition, something to do. Um, but then there are these two intermediate steps, and it's these two intermediate steps where the real assessment as learning stuff is going to happen. In the second step, we're actually going to show students the work that some of their peers submitted, anonymously presented, randomly selected, uh, and we're going to ask them to basically play the role of a teacher and assess the work and give feedback to each of those peers engaging a lot of critical thought and creative thought as, as they do so. Uh, and then as they're giving feedback to their peers, their peers are also giving feedback to their work. So in the third phase, the third phase will all be about teaching them how to learn from feedback. Um, that sort of growth mindset notion that we have. And I'm going to argue that a growth mindset is not easy for students to develop. We have to help them. And that's what'll be going on in the third step teaching them how to learn from feedback and again exercising a whole bunch of these skills as we do it okay so students will submit now they'll give feedback to peers they'll react to the feedback they got they'll then be able to revise their work based on the feedback and they will submit that to you so from the instructor perspective nothing really has changed because all of that stuff in the middle is driven by the students and the students value it. They see the relevance, they want more of it. Uh, and so it's a form of active learning that's very powerful. It doesn't create any more work for the faculty member, but it produces a whole lot more pedagogy. Uh, and you'll see that as we go through it. And so one more slide and, and then we'll be at the demo. I just wanna be clear about the demo. There's, there's a lot that you can do in these technologies. So for example, in, in our technology, students can work as individuals or they can work as groups as they go through things. Uh, assessments can be done sort of in within in a sort of constrained way, or you can actually control who assesses who or which groups assess which other groups. So for example, you could have a group of mentors assessing a group of mentees, and you could keep that separate. Um, and you can also do interesting case study approaches that we could talk about as well. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll finally mention, we can also do 360 degree reviews. So pure evaluations after group work where every member evaluates the contributions of each other. Um, all these things can be done. I'm going to have to focus in with the time we have. And so I'm going to focus on an example of what we call an individual student uh, activity where they're going through and all working as individuals um, through an activity. I just wanted you aware that all these other options were also possible uh, in case they come up in QA. Okay, I think that brings us to the big demo button. Ooh, yep, okay. So I will take over the screen at this point. Uh, there we go. And hopefully you guys see uh, a big screen here. Now, what would normally happen is there would just be one of these bars. Uh, and so I'm just showing you within Peer Scholar this process and how it would play out. Because again, I want you to have a very concrete sense of what this would feel like to the student. And then we can talk about you know, how hard it is to set up and things like that as well. Uh, but normally there would be just one of these activity bars. And over time, we would move from this phase being active to this one, to this one. Um, I've been able to just sort of create three versions and have each of them open so I can show them each to you um, at one point in time. But again, normally you'd be moving across that one bar. So a student would come in and there would be one big green button and they would click on that. Okay, so what happens? Let's do the first step. So there's create, assess, and reflect. So in create, they always come in and the first thing they get are instructions. And this is just an opportunity for, and this is one of the things the faculty member, you know, would have to think about a little bit, um, but this is them basically doing what they always do, you know, describing what they want students to do. To the extent there's a difference in this, you can do things like add live video, live video, video um, in here. So, you know, sometimes students aren't the best at reading, but they live in this sort of video world. Um, if you can create a short video that describes the activity to them, what you want to do. You won't be able to, to, to hear this, um, but I'll 
I mean, I probably could make it All so right, you you're welcome. Um, but you get the idea. And so this is just me describing the, the assignment to them, which in this case was, by the way, helping a local flight school um, to create more engaging lectures. They thought their lectures were a little dull. Uh, and so the task to students is, hey, learn some of the things you can do to make uh, a learning experience more engaging and make a pitch to the school about something they could do. And so we have to tell them what a pitch looks like. Uh, now I do that in two ways, by the way. I have a rubric, which always makes a lot of sense. I'm just gonna open it directly. So you can have a rubric like this that shows the, the four components, again, that should be in a good pitch, and then some words about what makes them a certain level. You'll see this kind of come back uh, in a moment. But I just describe that too. You notice visual aids, I'm talking about point three is visual aids, which is the point three here. So the idea here is the, the kind of cool thing is you can do micro learning directly in the instructions. Um, you can actually say, okay, we're gonna spend a bit of time talking about what a good pitch is because that's what you're going to have to do. And one of the real powers of this approach is they can learn about it and then immediately put their learning into action. Uh, and so we like that a lot. So the instructions are an opportunity to do a bit of micro learning and they say, okay, I understand. And now I have to create a pitch here. Um, now I've copied and pasted. Yep. So I already copied something from word and I'm just going to paste it here, keeping the formatting. And so this would be my pitch that I'm going to submit and, and we'll see this come back, um, all the way through. And you see how easy it was to copy and paste in from, from word or something like that. And I would just say, okay, that's my pitch. And I would go down and press um, submit at the bottom or save and submit. I'm not going to at this point because um, my demo gets corrupt. Well, it gets full of stuff if I do that. So I'm not gonna save, I'm just gonna exit anyway. So nothing real earth shattering with the create phase other than that ability to do micro learning. Mostly this is students submitting a composition. Things get a little more interesting here. Uh, and, and there's a few points I wanna make. So this is the, point where students are going to give feedback, right? So this phase, you get to be the teacher. Um, and so we kind of walk them through what it is they're going to do. Now, a lot of our faculty members don't really know, you know, don't have any formal training on how to give feedback well and why it's so tricky. And so one of the cool things is a lot of that expertise can be embedded. And so, for example, we have these videos that professors can just use because really everybody's doing the same thing by this point. They're asking students to assess work and give feedback. Uh, and so to give you a sense, you know, when, when we do this, we have a, a video about why should you care about doing this? So we call that the motivational video. You know, why, why is this a kind of a good thing for you to learn how to give feedback? Why is it so challenging? And so here we talk about the psychology of feedback and especially receiving feedback and how every time somebody receives constructive feedback, it kind of feels like they're being attacked and they naturally get a fight or flight reflex in place. This is why the growth mindset concept is harder than it seems uh, because it's not natural. People do not naturally say, oh, thank you for pointing out my flaws. Now I know the things I could work on. They don't. They say, oh, you, why did you? So, I, I won't say what they say, but they either fight your feedback or they flee it. That's the natural way. And so that's why we have to be very careful about how we give feedback to not trigger that sort of reaction. And so in a final video, we go through and say, okay, well, how do you, I don't, I look like I'm screaming in all of these videos. <laughs> I don't mean to look like I'm screaming, but we say, you know, what are the specific characteristics of constructive feedback? So, you know, just keep in mind here now, what we've done with students is we first of all calibrated them. We've got them all thinking about feedback the same way. We've let them know about the psychology of feedback and the challenges to it. And then we've told them, here's some things to keep in mind. Here are six things to keep in mind when you're giving feedback. And once they've now learned all of this stuff, we say, okay, go. All right. What are you seeing here? This is four of my peers have submitted their work. So I can flip between the four peers work. And notice, by the way, that in this activity, peers could do their work however they wanted, which is one of the fun things about digital products. You can let, you can let um, students do uh, just you know, videos if they want. So just to give you a sense here, you know, again, all of these videos can play directly within 
the technology. Hi, my name is Kayla McBride. I want to be very clear to say that we have all these students' permissions to, to use their work. Um, they've all said this is cool, this is fine. Um, and so what you can do now is look at that peer's work. And remember, it's a pitch, so a pitch could be verbal. And they then have to assess it. How do they assess it? Um, well, oops, sorry. I'm losing my assess frame here because um, I clicked on something I should have. It went down to the bottom is what it did. I, I stretched it, but that's okay. Let's just keep it at the bottom. Notice what they're, what they're doing here now. Um, they're being asked to score that pitch. If this looks familiar, I kind of hope it looks familiar because it's this, right? So this same rubric that we gave them a copy of, we now say, hey, remember we told you how to make a pitch and it had these four characteristics? Well, this person just made a pitch, score them, you know, use those characteristics and score how well they did um, in terms of their pitch, uh, et cetera. And so you can go through and you can score them on that A, B, C, D, E, F scale. And now what are we doing? We're walking them through an analysis of the work. So we say things like, hey, begin by highlighting something you thought was done really well and highlight that for the person because positive feedback is very powerful. And so, you know, highlighting something they did well, we're all very open to positive feedback. We embrace positive feedback. Uh, and so that can have a lot of power. And yeah, make sure you use that. Make sure you tell them things they're doing well, but then give them the constructive feedback. Now, let me bump this up a little bit because I want you to take a look at this wording as I make a point. If this student was going to change just one thing about their work, what should they change to maximally improve their work and how should they go about changing it? Remember everything you learned about constructive feedback when you write this. Um, and this is the difficult thing for people to do. This is where they're really giving that constructive feedback. But if you think about what I'm asking, just focus on one thing. Well, for a student to do that, they have to think about the whole pitch. What did that person say? I call that receptive communication. They have to think about it very critically. You know, what were the good parts, but what were the weak parts of that presentation? And once they figure out what those three or four weak parts were, they then have to say, okay, what's the biggest weak part? If they were going to change one of those, just one, which one is most in need of change? So that's a whole lot of critical thought. And now they say, okay, I know which one, and, and that's the one I'm going to tell them about, but what am I going to tell them to do about it? How do they change it? Well, that's the creative thought, you know, to think about how would they make it better. And now they have to express all of that to the peer. Uh, that's the expressive communication. Uh, and so they're exercising all of these skills when they do one peer. And notice this, by the way, too. I like to do things like this. Um, I like to just sort of keep them honest or at least play on their guilt if they're not. Um, you know, make them say, and here are your options here. You know, do you agree with this statement that you read their work carefully, thought deeply about how it could be improved, et cetera? And all I'm trying to do here is really make sure students spend some time giving good feedback. A, because that will benefit the receiver, and B, because it will benefit the person to put all that deep thought into it. Okay. Um, uh, all right, let me get this smaller again. And I wrap that around in a weird way. <laughs> Which, which only happens on a demo somehow where you could wrap it around so it messes up like that. Um, so at any rate, uh, they would do the same for peer two's work. They would do the same for peer three's work. And why is that important? Um, because they're getting repeated structured practice. They're, they're engaging those skills, but then they're engaging them again for the next peer, different context, again for the next peer, different context. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm actually going to leave this for a second. I'm going to pop right back in, which is probably what I should have done in the, in the first place. Um, yeah, just because I want that on the side where it is, if I hadn't gone and mucked away, there it is there. Um, and so they would go through all these peers and they would fill this out for each peer and get this repeated structured practice. And then at the end, they would see their own work. So before I get here, before I talk about the actual self-assessment part, let's just you know think about the following. They have now just seen four of their peers work on something they themselves did. Uh, and so this is my work, for example. I can see my work and I just looked at these other four peers. This gives me a really strong sense of how my work fits, right? And I like to say it this way. It's one thing for your instructor to say, you're doing B work. It's something else for you to see the peers uh, work and your own and, and say, I'm doing B work. 
um, I can see what a word looks like now and I can learn from it. So which is one of the advantages, right? They see good, positive exemplars, strong exemplars, and they can learn from it. So they're already getting that metacognitive hit of where their work fits. Um, but now we can actually enforce that a little bit more. So I've, I've have some questions here. The questions you have here could be the same as they answered for the others. These were the ones they answered for the others. Um, but you can also customize. And that's what I did in this part. I customized this for self-assessment. And so I'm asking them, um, what's something, now that you've seen everything, what's something you would um, change about your work um, in, in your revision? And I also asked them explicitly, where does your work rank according to the ones you've seen? Again, to really push them to do that comparison, that metacognitive kind of you know thought about what's going on. All right. So that's the second step, giving feedback. And if we just think for a moment, you know, what have we already done to the learning process? It used to be all the learning that was happening was happening when they created their composition. You know, now they did that, for example, created a pitch, but now they've seen and, and assessed a bunch of other pitches. So they have a much better sense of what a good pitch looks like now because they've seen all these exemplars and they've engaged in all this critical thought written in a repeated structured way. Um, and They've learned how difficult it is to give feedback. And that last part is important because the third step is all about them being on the receiving end of feedback. This is really the growth mindset kind of thing, right? If we give students feedback about things they can do better, will they learn from that feedback? And, and again, I told you it's tricky because they tend to fight or flee. So here's how we scaffold that, how we really walk them through it. First part's not going to be a surprise to you, um, but we're going to use micro learning, right? We can embed micro learning right in the assessment context. So why should I care about learning from feedback? You know, what's that going to do for me to spend the time and effort to learn this skill? And so we explain to them what that'll do for them. And these are like two or three minute videos, by the way, just to be clear. What's the optimal approach with respect to analyzing the feedback I received? So I'm going to see a bunch of feedback. Um, we, we don't want them to fight or flee. We want them to sit and think. And so we have to tell them how to do that. And part of what I tell them, by the way, is that you will almost always feel a negative emotional reaction when you read feedback. Constructive feedback makes us feel crappy um, and it makes us want to fight or flee. Uh, but I tell them, no, no, you, what you have to do is acknowledge that emotional reaction. Say, yep, that made me feel bad. Um, and then you have to try to push it out of the way and get to the point the person was making, because that's where the learning potential is, right? And so I talked to them about this process of having to go through this process, expecting the emotionality to be there, but then learning to, to take control of that emotional reaction to, the, to your own benefit to your own growth. Uh, and then we have one more here because we're going to allow them to revise their work after they analyze the feedback. Uh, a lot of them haven't done that. You know, they're just so used to submitting it by the due date and thinking it's done. This idea of going back to it and improving it is, is sort of new to some of them. And so we talk about that process of, of the revision and, you know, not necessarily listening to what every peer says, thinking about the ones you agree with, and then using that to guide your revision, etc. So again, a little bit of a little bit of micro learning, they go through this whole, you know, sort of focus thing on learning how to learn from feedback. And then right after we've told them that stuff in an informational way, we let them feel it in a physical way. That is, they're going to go through a process of assessing feedback. Now I'm almost scared to do this after I flip the other one, but I'm going to do it anyway. There we go. Excellent. Um, it's because I have the text so, so large, by the way, so you guys can see it well that I'm mucked up a little bit here. So what are you looking at here? This is my work. And, and you'll see as I go from peer to peer, that does not change. Well, you might see some of the yellows changing. I didn't really highlight this yellow. I, sh I should have in the in the create phase. When people are giving feedback, yes, they can use that form and, and do use that form, but they can also annotate the work directly. And by fall, this will also include videos that they'll be able to annotate the video so the person can play back the video and see the comments that somebody left. And so they can do that easily on text. And that's what we have here. And it's great for, for things like you know, this, you should have a reference, sentence structure, etc. And so now if I'm on Pier 1, what I'm seeing here is Pier 1's 
um, feedback of my work, both the, the little comments that they attach to my work, but also their overall feedback, including this one, you know, how could I have done better? What could I have done um, to, to what should I do to improve my work for the final submission? And what we're going to do here is really kind of step people through, step the students through the process of learning from feedback. And we do that through this little button here. For every piece of feedback, they have to answer some questions. Um, and again, we have a bunch of default questions that an instructor can just use off the shelf and everything's great, but of course they can modify anything they want. Um, and so just to give you an example in this one, I start by saying, how negative emotionally did reading this make you feel? And they can specify some value that made me feel a five on the very strong negative emotion. This is again consistent with that video that says begin by acknowledging the emotion label it yeah i feel whatever and then put it aside this is the put it aside putting the emotion aside what was the core piece of advice the peer was trying to express so by asking them to reword in their own words the point that that peer is making we're really pushing them to get to that point right to, to think about it that deeply um and and so they they do that then they can actually rate the feedback itself remember there was that video that said Constructive feedback has these six qualities. These are the six qualities that I talked about in the video. Uh, and so now people can actually score the feedback. Why is that important? It's closing a loop. You know, I gave feedback to five or six students. They all rate my feedback and I get to see what they thought of it. Um, I get to see the, what they thought of the tone from that negative, you know, how emotional they were, but I also get to see all their ratings on this rubric. And so I can now use that to guide formatively my future giving of rubric, and I can continually improve because I'm getting the feedback, in this case, about my feedback. You know, just like they used a rubric for the pitch as well and got feedback about the quality of their pitch. Uh, and so rubrics can be very powerful when used in this context. Um, and I also have a little one here. How likely will you follow this peer's work? Because I like to highlight to them this point here. You know, not all peers give good advice. Uh, and then, therefore, you shouldn't follow every peer's advice. You should think about it. That's what we're asking you to do. Think and understand. And then you decide. Make a reasoned decision. And so, therefore, you can say, I'm not going to follow this peer's advice. But show us you've thought about it. Um, and that's the important thing, uh, really, is to show us that you've spent the time understanding what that peer is arguing. I, by the way, prefer peer feedback to expert feedback because if an expert tells you what you're doing wrong, you just kind of go, hmm, okay, I guess. If you're an, you're an expert, you say it's wrong, so I guess I'll work on that, I guess. Um, but if a peer says this is what you're not doing right, you don't necessarily believe them. And so I think Peer feedback invites critical thought better than expert feedback does. And so I tell them it's noisy. Some of that feedback you should ignore. Some of it's going to help you get a better mark. And your task is to figure out which is which and then to use the good stuff. OK, so we're putting them into that rich context. Again, bigger picture, peer one's feedback. They can't just ignore it because they have all these questions they have to answer. And these questions are going to push them to analyze it deeper, engaging critical thought, creative thought, communication skills as they do. And whatever they do for peer one, they're going to do again for peer two, again for peer three. So they're getting that repeated structured practice. So it's a different context, right? It's a, it's a different set of feedback that they're interacting with now, but they're learning that skill of how to analyze it as they go through. And then, of course, once they've analyzed all the feedback, then we can give them the option to revise. We can say, OK, this was the work you originally submitted, but now go ahead and change it. Make it make it better. Take those comments that you got that you think could help you improve your work and do it. So, you know, immediately again, which is a big part of, of the practice that I believe in, teach them something and then have them do it right away. Uh, and it's the doing that really embodies the learning. Uh, and, and that's why we want to kind of do it that way. OK, that's a mile high um, of, of, of um, this sort of what's called formative peer assessment process that almost always involves those three steps. And you got a sense of how it would play out 
um, for a student uh, to do it that way. So maybe we will return. I'm going to stop sharing now and, and uh, maybe Megan, you want to um, throw back the other one. I'm just going to wrap up with a couple of things. I'm going to try to leave enough time so that we can have a bit of a QA here as well. So I'll just try to take five or six minutes um, once you have the power again. And I see sure. stuff going in chats and QAs, but I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring it for now because I don't want to be tempted. Sure. Well, we had some great questions and comments in there. Let me just make this full size here. So again, feel free to add your questions to the Q&A. This is the part where you get to ask all of your questions. And I don't think we're quite on the question part, though. There's just no, two. But keeps, yeah, Whenever I restart, it goes back to the beginning. So here's what you missed. Here's the quick, here's the quick summary. <laughs> <laughs> you will all receive okay. a copy of the recording. Um, sorry, back a bit, I think. And further and further. So two or three back. Yeah, so there's just a few points I wanted to make. Yeah, this is the first one. A few, few, few points I want to make quickly post demo. There's so much that I can't show you. And this is, I know this is not really legible, um, but it's just meant to tell you that there's also all these options about how you grade the work. You can give people participation grades for things. You can use peer averages if you've asked peers to give you quantitative values. Uh, and obviously you can have an expert come in and grade every component of what you saw. Um, you can assign different work to different TAs. You, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about late submissions and accessibility requirements. So trying to make sure that the process will run smoothly for all students with minimal um, harassment of instructors. They can talk to us directly, students can, et cetera. Um, and there's also a lot of metrics for the, to go back to the faculty member and go back to the institution in terms of, you know, actually seeing what's going on and, and looking for the, seeing the, the, the change and the improvement yourself uh, in the work. Let's flip to the next one. I'm just gonna do these real quick, just to let off. I've, I've kind of, mentioned this a little bit and I just want to highlight this power a little bit. When you use rubrics and, and you saw me use them a couple times, there's sort of a, a, a double advantage to using them. One is, you know, we often give students a rubric to guide their creation of something. So I'm asking you to be critical. So here's the components of a critical argument, let's say. And so they use that when they guide their argument. But we also use it for to have them assess the arguments other people create. So they're applying the rubric from an assessment kind of point of view, and they're learning a lot about the rubric and the concept it represents when they do that, right? They're saying, okay, good critical thinking has this characteristic. And then maybe I'm reading Megan's work and I see that characteristic. Oh, there it is. She does that really, really well. Um, and so now I suddenly have a clear idea of, of what that rubric means. So I get to learn the concept better. But the other cool thing is if five students are applying a rubric to my work, and if this is a validated rubric associated with some skill that we care about, then as long as it's five or more students, we have a lot of research that shows that the average of their um, measure is a good measure of that skill. So what that means is we can't, we, it's not only the case that we can develop skills using this approach, we can also measure them on the fly. And that means we can do things like recognize them. If somebody is particularly good every time we're asking them to be creative, we can badge or something them, um, highlight the fact that they are a really good creative thinker. And imagine an extracurricular record or a digital portfolio where we can now recognize the skills our students have, um, you know, not just their, their GPA at a given time. Institutions can also use these metrics um, to optimize the learning they're providing and, and really create a great skill context. Okay, next one. Yeah, and so this is just sort of a summary uh, of, of what you've done. I hope you've kind of seen some of this, but, but I'll just mention it quickly. So when we, you know, start by teaching somebody something like a pitch, for example, you know, what is a pitch? What are the characteristics? But as they go through this process, they learn that concept deeply really deeply. So it can be used to really deepen the information and concept learning. This is an alternative to information. It's an augmentation to information learning. Okay. They're learning how to give feedback, obviously, because they'd be doing this a lot. Uh, in fact, you know, in our, in many institutions, they have um, a lot of courses like 50 or 60 courses a term are using this. Uh, and so students run into it a lot and they get a lot of practice. Most importantly, they're exercising these skills. Um, which we can measure, document, recognize, and utilize. So that's very powerful. 
And, you know, the real point of all this at the end is they're learning how to use feedback to improve themselves as a person. That's what we call a growth mindset. It's not an easy thing to develop, but when we scaffold it as formula, formally as we do, then we can develop it. Okay, and I think that's it. So I have my little thank you very much info at Peer Scholar. Uh, if you want to know more, feel free to reach out. And now I'm I think I'm ready for Q and A. Thank you, Megan. Great. Well, thank you, Steve. So we had a few questions in the Q and A, and the first one, Dwayne's also supplementing answers as we speak. But what is um, the impact? What impact does this have on peer collaboration going forward? Thoughts on applying this to formative and summative assignments. Yeah. Yeah, and, and let me be clear. I mean, this can be done formatively and, and it can be done summatively. So, for example, in Holland, they're using it very heavily in their arts program um, where they're really they have a stream that's just arts and they don't want grades at all. They want it all to be formative, all to be qualitative comments that they're using to grow. Um, but you can do both with this, right? You can actually grade the work that's there in a more summative way. Uh, you can also use peer averages and, and get around having to have somebody grade it. So all of that's cool. But that first point that was made, you know, what does this do to peer interactions? You know, especially in, in Western cultures, we have a little bit more peer interaction. In Eastern cultures, they, they're not used to it. They're used to the information coming from the prof and, and they don't really learn from one another. And often we have to enculture them literally in this whole peer assessment process and show them that, you know, hey, this is a very powerful thing. And I think that's a good thing because when we go into the workforce, we're constantly working in peer groups. And so getting them used to that and that idea of, working with other students, you know, sometimes formally in a group, in the group work kind of projects, but also in this informal helping each other. One of the things you'll notice in one of those reports is, is we have research that shows when people do this peer assessment process, the sense of community between the students in a class, even a very large online class gets stronger. So it's literally bringing the students together. It's pro-social. And so it makes them, you know, much more open to working with their peers in the future and helping each other. And I think that's a, just a fantastic thing. Great. And speaking of peers, we have another question and you touched on this in the beginning, but are peers assigned randomly? Yeah. And what if a student got feedback from weak students? Would not this be unfair since others might have received excellent feedback from, uh, you know, really strong peers? So one of the things that, that we like to do, uh, it's a balancing act. Um, you have to think of student workload, but I like to have lots of peers. So my favorite examples of these, uh, don't ask peers to write too much, you know, maybe a two pager or a page or something. And then we ask them to assess five or six or seven of their peers. So more repetition, which builds more of those skills, which is very important, but it also helps with that issue specifically. You know, if it's just one other peer, for example, then the quality of that peer that reviews them is going to be important. If that peer is not a very good reviewer, then I don't get much to work with. But if we have five or six people reviewing my work, then what we're probably going to get is some that aren't very good and some that are quite good. Um, and, and again, we're really pushing them all to find something. The number one point of the feedback was find something this person can improve. Um, you know, you can't just say, oh, this is all great. You have to highlight something. So if you have a large enough sample, then usually the person is going to get some good feedback. But the other thing we say is worst case scenario, you are the best in the class. Nobody can make your writing any better because it's already perfect. Uh, and so you go into this and you get no useful feedback. Wow, what a waste of your time, right? Well, no, because you had a lot of practice giving feedback to those people who aren't nearly as clever as you are. Um, and so you've had a lot of practice teaching other people, you know, how their work can be better. And if you're half as good as you seem to think you are, then you're probably going to be in a position where that's part of your job in the future. And so you may not be learning how to personally grow because you've already grown. I don't believe many people have reached this point, but you can still be helping others grow. And, and this is helping you learn that uh, as well. Uh, and you're doing the critical thinking and the creative thinking, all that stuff um, as well. So yeah, those are the ways around that. Great example. I spend a lot of my day writing and Kim and my colleague, Lindsay, do a lot of the work improving my writing. So I completely understand. 
Let me, let me also just jump on one other point because I, you, you, you started and I, I ignored it. How are peers assigned? So they are kind of assigned randomly. We say that because that's the quick and easy thing to say. But we also, and this is Dwayne's expert work, um, he's come up with all these algorithms under the hood um, that, that do things like deal with late activities. So how to make sure that if someone submits late, everything continues on smoothly nonetheless. And so that affects who we select to review um, as things happen and also as this is used institutionally and as we get a memory for the students so to speak we can know how they've performed in the past and other peer scholar activities and we can in fact choose the reviewing group more intentionally we can literally make sure that we have somebody that's that's better than this person and somebody that's not necessarily as good at least based on past performance so we can create the, these heterogeneous groups that we know lead to the best learning um, and, and so that's sort of happening under the hood. So I say randomly, um, but, the, but it's actually fancier than randomly. Um, it's just the easiest way to say it quick. Great, thank you. Well, we have a handful more here. And this is one I, I find very compelling. How can bullying be prevented among peers? Yep, cool. So let me just highlight one thing that's super important. Everything was anonymous. It doesn't have to be anonymous. You can toggle that off if you want students to be able to you know, discuss the reviews afterwards. But by default, it's all anonymous. And so first of all, that means that anything, you know, any sort of biased response to someone's work that's based on their gender or their culture is pretty hard to do because you don't see their name. Uh, all you see is their work. Um, and so that's what you're reacting to. Now you can still, you could probably detect English as a second language in, in you know, written work and, and somebody could still be a bully on that. What I do, and it's worked very well, I've used this for, I don't know, 12, 15 years now. We were a little ahead of the curve on alternative, alternative assessment. Um, but I, I just remind all students, there is a code of conduct. And while you guys are anonymous to one another, you're not anonymous to, to me. Um, all of your comments that you create are in the system, and if you say or do anything that violates our university's code of conduct, you will be um, dealt with appropriately. And we've just not had issues um, of, of that sort happening. So it's not common. Um, in fact, I, I've not heard anyone's suggestion of anybody feeling like they were bullied with this system. Um, but if, but again, to the extent it happens, we can police it and, and have all the data to support it in, in a way that's, you know, not possible in other sort of hall room, hallway bullying or, or stuff like that. Excellent. Thank you. Will peer assessments still be effective for classes with lesser than 20 students? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no, I mean, peer assessment began in K to 12, small classes, hand your work to the person beside you and take their work back. And even in that one where you can see the person and you're probably friends with them, blah, 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 peer assessment still has been shown to be a powerful learning experience. When you make it anonymous, et cetera, um, all the more so. So the only, the only hitch that can happen in a smaller class and I always joke about it this way, you know, there's that one student who cannot write anything without having a Star Wars reference in their in their writing work. If, if they do that, um, then they're going to sort of give up their anonymity. People will go, oh, yeah, that's Steve. He always has to talk about guitars and everything he writes about, something like that. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, that's really the only difference in a small class. There's the possibility in a small class, by the way, and Dwayne's done a lot of this research of having them do a peer scholar activity before they come to a seminar class and really having them know what each other's thinking uh, about the, the reading of the week or whatnot before they come into the class. And, and Duane has used this a lot and found that it really creates, we sometimes call the myth of the small classroom. The myth is, you know, that all these people interact so, so excitedly. The reality is usually we're trying to get three people to shut up and 17 people to talk, right? And Duane has found that when they do the, the activity ahead of time, they get more of that myth. Uh, they, they get more closer to the myth of the small classroom where they are all interacting a lot more because they kind of know what's coming. They're just waiting. I, mean, I didn't know Megan was the one that thought that about what we wrote, but I know somebody was. And when Megan now in the classroom says, well, here's what I thought. Oh, yeah, I've thought about what you thought already. And here's what I thought about what you thought. But I'm ready, right? And I don't have to think on the fly. I get a chance to, to think ahead of time. So it works very well in small classes. And let me just mention my class is me and 1,600 students, uh, Canadian style intro psych class. Uh, and this is what we created for. So in a very large class, 
it allows students to feel like they're in a smaller Socratic unit that's helping each other out. Uh, and so it works very well in, in large and online. And in fact, one of the papers that I've got there shows that it, it has worked in virtually every class context in every area at every level. Uh, and so it really does scale to whatever because it's content agnostic, right? It's about the process and that can be applied to any content area. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Do students get points or is there an incentive for them to make peer reviews? So what, what we would normally recommend, um, I, I've talked about the whole process as though they're sort of an expert on the end who would probably grade things like that final product. And if that expert is going to grade the final product, then I would also encourage them to grade the quality of the feedback that students are giving. And we make that very easy for them to do because the feedback is kind of like the oil in this machine, right? If everyone's giving good quality feedback, then everyone's getting good feedback and, and they really appreciate the whole process. Um, so yes, I would usually say at least grade those two parts, but even if you're using peer averages, remember that the peers were applying a feedback rubric to the feedback they received. And so you can even use the average of that rubric. I gave feedback to five people. They all scored my feedback. I can use that average score um, and apply that to the student as their feedback grade for what they did. Um, and yeah, I would certainly recommend um, doing that. The other kind of cool thing you can do, by the way, is instead of grading the final product, you can grade the process. You can grade the change uh, from the draft to the final product as a result of the comments uh, students received. And this is really good in a small class. You can really reward students for having a growth mindset, you know, not for necessarily the quality of what they produce, but for their willingness to listen and learn and grow. Uh, and so you can mix those product and process kind of grades and, and really kind of have the resolution on, on your assessment that matches the richness of the learning that they've experienced. Excellent. Well, again, here's the contact information if you have more questions for Steve, Steve and Dwayne. And we really appreciate this, this deep dive into the demo. And we have exciting news for our WCET members. So if you're a member, uh, make sure to log into Mix and you can join the community where you can ask Steve any follow-up questions about authentic assessment, and he'll be responding to those asynchronously. So Steve is our first featured Ask the Expert, and he's been a great sport as we've, as we've been uh, trying to kick this off. So we're excited that this is lining up. And then we are releasing a closer look guide on alternative assessment also in the community, which is Mix. And that includes great conversations about some effective practices as well as DEI perspectives on alternative assessment. So if you're not a member, reach out and we can certainly give you more information about joining our community. Here's some helpful links there. And we also have tons of great content on our website that is free and open to all, including links to our previous webinars. And there's some useful links there. And we will be sending the link to this recording out. And we'll include the link to our previous webinar on world perspectives on alternative assessments as well. You might find that really interesting. Next week, we'll be releasing videos daily on OER perspectives from all across the world. The one I watched today was from Bangladesh. So be looking for those and those are free and open to all, of course. So check back on our website. And for members, we have our policy series continuing. Our next uh, episode is on April 21st. Oh, and we also, this, this is how we stay out of trouble. We keep ourselves very, very busy here at WCT. So our WCT Leadership Summit part two is airing May 4th. And that is also open to everybody in our annual meeting, save the date there. So without further ado, I'd just like to acknowledge our WCT annual sponsors that help underwrite much of the programming and events here we do for all of you and our supporting members, Colorado State University, Michigan State University, and welcome University of Florida. So again, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Steve, Dwayne, we really appreciate you jumping on to do this. And Steve, we'll see you, our fellow Ask the Expert in WCT Mix. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye all. Have a wonderful day.